welcome everybody, especially our um, external guests. You are attending a weekly colloquium at the Center for Theoretical Physics of the Polish Academy of Sciences. We are physically located in uh, Warsaw. My name is Jarek Korbic, and it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, who is um, Chiara Marletto uh, from University of Oxford. And Chiara will talk about a uh, recently very exciting topic that has generated a lot of um, a lot of uh, research activity and uh, debate and discussion namely witnessing non-classicality beyond quantum theory i suppose this beyond will be gravity chiara our pleasure and the ground is yours okay uh, thank you very much for for inviting me to to talk um, and uh, you know for, for coming to this talk uh, so I, um, I think I try to, uh, to give an overview of these ideas um, and then hopefully there'll be some space for discussions if some of the things I say are not uh, detailed enough. I would like to start with a description of the kind of problem that um, the theoretical tools I'll be describing um, were designed to, to address. And the problem is... Um, a general problem that's been around for, for a long time, um, addressed by various people with different techniques. And it can be phrased as the question uh, of whether it's possible to have a quantum universe uh, with a fully classical sector inside it. Um, and it's, is it possible to have a, a consistent description of, of this kind of um, physical uh, reality? And uh, perhaps a, um, kind of one can see this as a special case of, of, of a more general is issue, um, which is whether you can think of, of, of a hybrid system, which is composed of a quantum subsystem, which interacts with one that isn't fully quantum. And the, um, the problem is quite old, as I said, and um, the, the person that started this kind of um, tradition of uh, trying to address uh, the problem is actually Bryce DeWitt. Um, and and um, so I think to put it in a way that um, I think is close to the way he was thinking about this problem is um, to wonder whether quantum features are infectious in a sense that, um, so the DeWitt's idea uh, was that somehow uh, quantum theory has a, a totalitarian property in the sense that um, when you have a quantum system inside um, a, a larger system and then you assume that this quantum system interacts in some plausible way with the rest, then the rest has got to be uh, quantum too. And I'll specify a bit more clearly what quantum means and so on, but this is kind of the general idea that, that uh, the wit had. Um, and the way, so he, he, he kind of proved a, a theorem where um, assuming a number of, of, of um, axioms, uh, including <clears throat> um, something like Hamiltonian dynamics uh, and, and various other formal properties um, that are proper of both quantum theory and classical physics, um, um, he proved that if a quantum system couples to another system, um, uh, S, then S has got to be a uh, quantum two. Uh, now, this theorem that he proved um, is is um, is an argument, you know, is a theorem that um, is based on on a number of assumptions that are very strong. So it's it's heavily uh, based on on the formalism, for example, of as I said, Hamiltonian mechanics, um, and and so it 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 feels like it's assuming too too much. So in a way, it's almost um, sounds like it's putting um, uh, a lot in the axioms and, and therefore um, it's desirable to make it more general and to um, try to free it from, from these assumptions. So this is the first part of the talk. I'll try to uh, build up to a theorem which was then used as a base for uh, an experiment which um, we recently proposed in order to um, check that uh, a mysterious quantum, a mysterious system, uh, which for which we don't know exactly uh, the dynamical feature, such as gravity, uh, is or isn't quantum. So I'll, I'll try to build up to this uh, experiment, which will be the end of the talk, through a number of steps, 
The first one uh, of which is to generalize the uh, theorem by, by the width in a way that assumes less and specifically assumes less about <clears throat> the specific formalism that describes the dynamics of the system Q and the system S. Um, so that's what I would like to do. So generalize the argument using um, a, a principle-based approach that doesn't commit to any specific dynamics. So the question is, how can we, uh, so the first steps to do this is to express the concept of, of non-classical um, in a way that's dynamics independent. So we don't want to use um, ideas from uh, quantum theory um, or, or um, ideas from say Hamiltonian mechanics and so on. We would like to, to, to be as general as possible. Um, so to do this, I introduce a, a framework, which I uh, developed a, a while ago with uh, David Deutsch. Um, and in this framework, you can describe uh, physical systems that are uh, classical and physical systems that, are, that have features of, of, of quantum systems by putting constraints on them um, regarding the kind of transformations you can perform uh, on, on, on each of these systems. So the first kind of systems I want to introduce is called an information medium. And in, you know, in, in, in your mind, you can think of it as being um, the, the prototype of a, of a classical system, if you like. Uh, so um, it's a system that has a set of attributes, um, which we call X, uh, which can be permuted and copied. Now, um, by copy, I mean um, this transformation here. So if X is made of these attributes 0, 1, 2, N, you can think of an attribute as a set of states. Um, the copy task on this set uh, consists of this transformation where uh, I'm thinking of having a, um, <clears throat> an ordered pair describing the joint system of uh, two replicas of, of the same um, information medium. And uh, as you can see, this kind of transformations um, executes a, a copy-like operation from the first slot to the second lot, slot when uh, the second slot is initialized in, in a blank state. So this is a very information theoretic type of definition for, for copying. And we take this as a, as a sort of definition of what classical information is. Um, so X is, we call an information variable, and you can think of X, for example, as, as, as a set of N orthogonal quantum states, or X could be just um, a set of um, different states for a classical system that are all distinguishable from each other, and so on. Then um, you can give a set of constraints that these information media should obey. And this is like a sort of algebraic constraints that you put on the kind of tasks you can perform on, on, the, on the information media. And the most important of these constraints, we call the interoperability principle. And the interoperability principle says that if you have two such systems that obey, uh, that, that kind of satisfy the definition of an information medium, and you consider them jointly, and each of them has an information variable x1 and x2, um, the joint system is also an information medium with the information variable x1 Cartesian product x2. Um, so what this means informally uh, is that the, um, if you consider the joint system of, of, of two subsystems that can each um, instantiate information, the composite system can, um, can also instantiate information and uh, you know, this poses also a constraint on the cardinality of the set of distinguishable states that this joint system must have. So if you like, you can take this as a, a principle which requires um, you know, uh, the possibility of coupling uh, different subsystems, each of which you're assuming um, is, a, is a, a good kind of information medium. Um, so it's, it's assuming the fact that you can put them together and, and set up some interactions uh, between them which will allow you to address the joint system also as, a, as an information medium. Um, and if you like, this is the assumption that all theories of computations um, already make in a sort of informal way, but here we are fleshing it out and, and expressing it with, with this constraint. And then uh, further to this, we can add a further class of systems, which we call uh, super information media in the sense that they have additional properties compared to uh, simple information media. 
and this should be the generalizations of, of uh, quantum systems. Um, so super information media are um, systems with at least two information variables whose union isn't an information variable. And to try to <clears throat> give you an example so that you can understand what I'm trying to get at with this definition, um, you can think of a, of a qubit, so um, a quantum spin, for example, uh, with uh, two different uh, uh, complementary bases. Uh, so the, the, the variable X contains the, um, say, two uh, eigenstates of, of um, say, sigma X, and the observable Y contains um, two different uh, eigenstates of the observable, for example, sigma Y. And if you take the union, the set union of these two sets, you will get a set of attributes uh, that are no longer an information variable. So in particular, the task of copying them um, perfectly in the fashion that I said earlier uh, isn't possible. And so this is how, say, quantum systems are a special case of these superinformation media. And then with all of these um, assumptions, you can prove that uh, there is a structure of this kind. And I won't go into the details of the proofs, uh, but I would like to just explain the way we are thinking about uh, physical systems with this type of construction. Um, so there is this class, which we call the information media, which are systems with a set of attributes of these joint attributes that can be permuted in all possible ways and copied. And then you have a subset of these, um, which uh, we call in super information media that have this additional property that <clears throat> two different um, um, information variables um, of, of each of these systems, when you consider them uh, uh, jointly, uh, they are no longer an information variable. Uh, so that suggests um, something uh, generalizing the idea of no cloning um, for those who, who are kind of familiar with this type of language from quantum information. And then uh, you can show that quantum systems are a, a, a sub um, um, a set of, of this bigger set of super information media, and in particular have all the qualitative properties of, of uh, so super information media have all the qualitative properties of quantum systems. Um, and the, the construction is powerful because we haven't used, um, we don't use probability distributions in doing this. So it's all uh, kind of proven within this context of set theory and um, giving constraints about uh, what um, transformations are allowed and not allowed uh, in the way that I said. And the other thing is that because we are not using, uh, you know, we're just asking really that uh, very, very um, weak uh, sorts of requirements such as, for example, that the states of these systems um, are part of a space with, with um, um, a topology defined on it and, and so on. Uh, we are hoping that this way is a good way to describe um, hybrid systems and, and prove general statements about them. So we want to go back to this problem that I started with, um, you know, the, the WITS problem, uh, the way that I like to think about it and improve uh, on, on, the, on, the, on the result that he, that he uh, proved at the time. Okay, so for doing so, we can now with all of these uh, nice um, set of definitions that I gave you, uh, we can define, we can try to define quantum beyond quantum theory in the sense that we can try to do that without appealing to the usual notions of um, uh, Hilbert spaces and, uh, and uh, unitary transformations and so on. Um, so we can say a system is non-classical. So I won't say quantum because I would like to go for a lesser property than quantum. So it's just non-classical. Uh, if it has at least um, two incompatible variables, X and Z, and by incompatible here, we mean that um, it's impossible to copy X and Z jointly um, to perfect accuracy. So this, I, this is generalizing this idea of non-commutativity again, uses uh, where X and Z are, are um, two variables in the sense that I said earlier. And the, um, uh, the idea is to, is to require um, some sort of impossibility of a given transformation on the union of the set X and the set Z. Um, so if you're thinking of what this means and uh, you are you know, familiar with quantum theory, you can think of X and Z as two incompatible observables, but we are not defining them appealing to the usual ideas of quantum theory. We're trying to do that in a, in a more general way. 
Okay, so having defined now non-classical in this way, um, we can use three, um, three different principles. We can uh, set out uh, three axioms that I'd like to use to prove uh, this generalization of the Witt theorem. Um, so the first one is locality in the form of no action at a distance. Um, and I'm happy to elaborate on that in the discussions. Um, so it's the same way in which say, if you take the Eisenberg picture of quantum theory, you will see that no action at a distance is satisfied. So, so it's, it's, it's kind of a good principle because both quantum theory and classical theories that we um, think are uh, plausible satisfy this principle. Uh, then we have interoperability of information, which is this uh, axiom I mentioned earlier to do with what happens if you have two um, systems, each of which is an information medium and you put them together, um, you should still be able to address the joint system as an information medium. Um, and then one-to-one um, -one, uh, dynamics. So these are three um, assumptions that we, that we put in. Um, and then uh, you can prove this generalization of, of, of the, the Witts argument, which is a generalization because it's dynamics independent. It doesn't rely on a specific formalism uh, for dynamics. And the generalization is that if you have a um, um, non-classical system Q defined in the way that I said it just now, um, if Q couples to another system S um, through a copy-like interaction, then uh, you can show that S must be non-classical too in the sense that it has to have um, these two variables that are incompatible with each other. And these two variables are incompatible with each other in a strong sense, in the sense that quantum variables are. Uh, so it's not enough, for example, that S is just a, um, a system that obeys some stochastic laws uh, in the way that, um, uh, that sometimes one can do in say statistical mechanics or, or similar schemes. Pardon, uh, there uh, Chiara, is, yeah, there's a yeah, raise. I have, uh, I have uh, one quick question, if I, if yes. I may. Uh, what is this uh, copy-like uh, interaction? Have I missed it? Yes, it's. Um, yeah. I, uh, it was some. Let me just go back so I can show you. Uh, it's oh, an interaction right. that can perform this kind of task. Got it. Okay. So okay. You, you know, if you put like, no, no, it's it's a great question because I maybe I should have put that on the, on that slide so that. Um, so the first slot, let's say, is Q, and the second slot is S. And um, if we assume that there is a copy-like interaction possible between these two systems, which is a bit like assuming that it's possible to um, measure accurately at least one of the variables of the system S and the system Q, then uh, the theorem holds with the assumptions I, I said. Uh, so let me go back here. So yeah, it's a good question because um, it's important to know what are the assumptions. And I think, uh, so this, this assumption seems to be uh, minimal in the sense that we are uh, assuming what we usually assume of any system that we can um, measure in, in an accurate way. So I think um, this is a, a somehow a, a general assumption. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll uh, thanks for the question. So that's the first step. Uh, now, the, the next step is, okay, so let's, uh, so supposing you, 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 you buy this idea that um, if you have one sector of the universe, which is non-classical, then, and then if you assume that there is another sector uh, which can interact with these copy-like operations with this first sector, then the other sector also has to be non-classical. So we, we we try to establish this idea of, of, of uh, the wits in a more general way. Um, now, suppose that you wanted to test with an experiment that S is non-classical. So one thing is to prove in theory that you know, S must have some theoretical features, uh, such as these two incompatible variables. Another thing is to say, well, I want to set up uh, some kind of experiment whereby um, probing S in some way I can extract, uh, um, as it were, information about these two non-classical um, uh, variables that I, that I keep referring to. And this is an interesting problem because, of course, you can think of S as being a system with which we can interact some, in some way, uh, but um, of which we don't know much. For example, uh, this could be, um, well, 
it could be a, a, a macroscopic system, which we don't know whether it, for example, collapses away from, from the behavior of quantum theory um, or unitary quantum theory or not. Um, <clears throat> or it could be, of course, gravity, where there are lots of different proposals to describe the way in which it should uh, you know, incorporate some quantum effects. But uh, these different proposals are inequivalent, and we don't know which one actually is um, the one that we should use. Uh, so it, it would be nice to have a, a way of, of um, making an argument by which you can actually design a test which is robust against these different variants of, of models that you might be used to, to describe S and be able to conclude that when you probe S in a way and then you extract some characteristic signal out of it, uh, then S has got to be non-classical. So it can be described by classical theory. Um, by the way, when I say this about gravity, I often um, get these comments from people who are um, already in the field of quantum gravity and they are completely happy with the idea that gravity is, is non-classical in this quantum. And I actually must say that I, um, I mean, I'm kind of more on that, on that side myself, but this argument should try to um, uh, refute, you know, the, the, those other views around uh, that exist in the community where um, there's still an idea that gravity could behave fully classically um, and, and, uh, and so on. So I think that's the kind of spirit with which I'm approaching this problem. So the idea is to try to probe S, which in your mind you can think of as gravity, but it's more gen more general system uh, that we want to prove is non-classical with uh, two objects that we can treat um, as quantum systems. So we, we know that we have a kind of quantum control on, on each of them. Um, and and the, the, you know, the idea is how, how, do we, how do we set up an experiment whereby by uh, letting Q and Q prime interact with S um, one at a time, uh, we can extract then some measurable features of, of uh, Q and Q prime that tell us something about the fact that S is non-classical. Okay, so here's another theorem, um, which we call, uh, you know, dynamics independent witness of non-classicality. Uh, the theorem is the base of this experiment, of this proposed test. The theorem says that if S, so first the, uh, the assumptions, well, we, we assume only two things now. Again, locality in the form of no action at a distance. And another assumption is um, the interoperability of information. Uh, for all of the systems involved. Um, so the, the, the theorem says that if S can locally mediate entanglement between Q and Q primed, then S is non-classical. By, by locally mediate entanglement, I mean that um, Q is let, um, you know, is, is allowed to interact uh, in a pairwise fashion with S. Uh, Q prime can interact pairwise with S but uh, we don't allow direct interaction between Q and Q primed. So if you want to think of this dynamically, although you don't have to, to prove the theorem, but let's say to help the, the intuition, um, if you think of a Hamiltonian that describes the, this, this uh, three body interaction, you will have only terms that couple observables of Q with observables of S uh, and observables of S with observables of Q prime, but not direct terms of interaction between Q and Q primed. So under these assumptions, uh, we can show that um, if you can, uh, you know, you, you can get S to create entanglement between Q and Q primed, then S is non-classical. And note that when I say uh, entanglement between Q and Q prime, this concept of entanglement, which uh, is rooted within quantum theory, can also be generalized uh, in the uh, in this more general framework that I uh, outlined earlier. So. You don't have to commit with the formalism of quantum theory to the formalism of quantum theory to talk about um, Q and Q prime being entangled. But if you want to do that, then the theorem still still goes through, and S can be described in this um, uh, type of framework that I that I introduced earlier as um, as an information medium that can couple with Q and Q prime. Okay, so, uh, and, um, you know, I think there've been lots of um, uh, comments about this, this, this theorem. Uh, and um, so this is a, a, you know, kind of uh, an interesting piece of work. I think, uh, at least I was very excited about it because 
um, it sounds you're proving something about features of quantum systems without assuming the full quantum apparatus, which is, I think it's, it's very nice and, and uh, promising maybe if you're thinking of quantum theory as a transient theory that will then be modified in one way or another to accommodate the future theory. Um, okay, so now I will illustrate, the last part of the talk will be an illustration of how we can apply this general argument to a specific experiment that um, I propose with uh, Vedral uh, and, and then uh, uh, also uh, Sugato Bose and, and his team proposed. Um, and I think the, 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 the scheme is the same. And I think the rationale was, was a bit different the way we thought about it. Um, but it's, it's very nice somehow that, that um, we, we kind of both converged on this, on this idea. Um, okay, so now I will drop the dynamics independent part of the, of the, of the talk and I will uh, give you this example and to uh, show that is, it is experimentally plausible to, uh, you know, access this kind of regime, I will have to uh, use specific um, models, but so therefore decouple please this part of the talk from the first one, which was a kind of bit more uh, general. Um, so more, more abstract. Okay, so here you have our, um, you know, original uh, abstract scheme with Q and Q prime being the quantum systems that you're using to probe this mystery uh, system S. Of course, in this case, uh, S is gravity. Um, and so here M and M are actually Q and Q prime. So these are two masses um, and we are imagining a, kind of thought experiment where we are putting them into a, a superposition of different locations. And for those who are familiar with uh, experiments such as um, um, the, the famous cow experiment where um, a neutron was uh, placed in an interferometer and then you know the gravitational field of the earth was affecting the um, uh, diffraction uh, pattern of this neutron, um, the, the, this, this experiment is effectively doubling the complexity of that, of that, of that experiment. And on top of it, um, the gravitational interaction that's relevant is not the interaction between the, these, each of these two masses and the, the gravitational field of the, of the, and the Earth. So the earth is kind of factor out. So we're thinking of this as being kind of parallel to the uh, earth's surface, but the relevant interaction is between uh, each of the two masses. And the most crude model that we can use at this stage, which anyway was good for uh, the cow experiments. Uh, so in a sense, it's kind of corroborated experimentally, at least to some accuracy, is the Newtonian limit um, in which you can describe a, a, a very, um, non-general relativistic and very classical interaction from this point of view between the, the masses in question. Now, each of these, so when, when each of these masses uh, uh, is, let's say, on a branch of this interferometer, will feel um, the effect of the presence of the other mass on one of the two branches. And this leads to um, four different phases that appear in the wave function of the uh, joint two masses. So if you use a very simplified model where each of the branches are labeled as zero and one, and you write the initial state of the masses after the first beam splitter is uh, this state over here. Um, and then you apply a um, very simple dynamical evolution where you're just trying to understand the order of magnitude of these phases that are being formed through uh, this interaction then you will see that each of these terms, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, will um, acquire four different uh, phase factors, each of which is uh, you know, written like this, where the i is the different distances between the four configuration of the, of the arms of the interferometer. And uh, the interesting thing is that if you plug some numbers in and you would like, for example, so let me neglect, um, you know, just think of the, the two of the uh, interferometer arms are, are close enough to interact. So we only have one phase just to kind of fix the ideas. And you want this phase to be large enough to create entanglement between the two masses. 
So for example, we can get a maximal entangled state, which has phi equal to pi. Um, to get that, which is this state over here, you need masses of this order of magnitude, uh, distances of, of uh, the order of the micrometer and the kind of time of flight about a microsecond. And this was somehow very promising. So I don't want to kind of dwell much on this experiment, but I think what um, seemed to have excited uh, people um, from various communities is that the masses are not um, uh, as large as say Planck's mass. And this is somehow interesting because it seems like we are probing a regime where say, um, well, first of all, general relativistic effects are not important at all but you can catch a glimpse of, of quantum features um, in, in gravity still. Uh, and so, you know, um, there were then lots of variants proposed uh, after, after these two first papers, um, more are, are, are coming along. And the idea is that hopefully this experiment will at some point be realized. And so if entanglement is observed using the theorem I said, whether or not you commit to a specific dynamical model, you will be able to conclude that gravity has to be um, um, non-classical, by which we mean that classical theories of gravity that obey the axioms I outlined, which are quite general in a way, um, are not uh, suitable models for, for the gravitational uh, interaction in this particular um, re regime that we are probing. And um, so let me give a few words for a summary. So what I uh, showed you is that um, if you assume these dynamics independent principles of interoperability and of locality, um, and by dynamics independent, I mean we're not committing to a specific formalism of the various dynamical laws that we currently know are uh, good to describe uh, physical systems. Um, well, then classical gravity appears to be impossible if uh, we can show that it can interact with uh, non-classical entities such as Q and Q primed and then create entanglement between two of them. Um, and with this nice theorem that I told you about, uh, it looks like we can rule out a, a wide class of, 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 of classical models for gravity. Um, and uh, you know, if, if we can then achieve this uh, tabletop experiment and the experiment is successful in the sense that it shows entanglement, then um, these, these classical models of gravity are, are, are no longer viable. And this applies to classical models that we currently know and also the future ones that we might come up with so long as they comply to these two general axioms. Um, and finally, so like um, maybe thought provoking kind of um, last slide. Um, so the two key features of this sweetness of non-classicality and the reason why I'm saying it's beyond quantum theory is really, uh, really these two key features. Uh, the first point is that the principles underlying the theorem are expressed formally and conceptually independently of, of a specific dynamics and also scale, um, which is very promising. And the other point is that, um, as I said, you can rule out this um, vast class of, of, of classical models. Um, and thanks to this general argument, it doesn't matter whether the entanglement you observe is really the one predicted with this linear model of, of uh, quantum gravity that I used in order to make, you know, present this uh, simple estimate of the phase. Even if you were to observe a, a different uh, value for the phase, so long as we observe entanglement, we will uh, be able to, uh, to use the theorem and say that gravity can't be classical in that case. Um, and in a sense, I think of this result as, um, as a generalization of Bell's theorem. So in um, you know, the start of quantum information, Bell's theorem was very important because it, uh, it told us a, a method to um, rule out a, a vast class of, of uh, stochastic theories um, to model physical systems that violate uh, Bell inequalities. So we know that um, no matter what kind of dynamics we're using to describe something, if we have correlations that uh, exceed the value that's predicted by, uh, by uh, the, the in various inequalities that you can pick, um, then those uh, systems that are producing those statistical um, uh, signatures cannot be described by local hidden variable models. 
And likewise, I think this theorem that we have um, has the same uh, logic and the same power in a way because um, like Bell's theorem is not rooted in a specific formalism and it's a, like a meta theorem. It's, it's at the level of, of a meta description of, of uh, uh, physical laws. And this is why we think it is like a first step of a generalization of quantum information beyond quantum theory itself in a way that will be robust against a, a variance of, of uh, quantum theory that we might find as we make progress in, in our understanding of, of physical reality. Um, okay, so I think I'm, um, I'll, I'll stop here and I'm very happy to, to open to questions. Thank you very much for, for listening. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Chiara, for a very interesting uh, talk. Uh, well, um, we are open for questions. Um, I propose that we ask questions via microphone, via voice, not uh, not writing. Maybe although there is already one <clears throat> one more question which I can which I can read, which is on which is on the chat. So. Um, a question from um, Shubhayan Sarkar. Isn't it very similar to idea of entanglement swapping? Two systems do not interact uh, directly, um, but, do, but to create entanglement among them, we need an entangled state and local operations can create entanglement. Yes, I think um, this is exactly the... So if you wanted to make a model of, of what's going on in, in, within quantum information, you would, you would use um, a protocol like the one you just outlined. So it's a very perceptive question. Um, the reason why we cannot directly apply this local operation and classical communication type of reasoning is that um, we wanted to have a theorem that had uh, that had validity beyond quantum quantum theory itself. Because given that we don't know whether mm. the um, you know the mediator S gravity or whatever that is um, obeys the, fully the laws of quantum theory. It's, uh, in a sense, you know, at the level of the theorem, it would be circular to say, right, if we um, assume quantum information to be true for the system, for the mediator, as well as for Q and Q prime, then we can show that, um, say, if, if S is fully classical, it cannot be um, generating entanglement because of um, local operation and classical communication theorem. Um, the reason being that these theorems are based on unitary quantum dynamics and we didn't want to assume that. So, so I think the, the question is, is very um, uh, nice in the sense that it kind of illustrates a way of modeling what's going on. But in this theorem, we were trying to be more general than this theorem. This, if you like, the theorem provides a generalization of LOCC theorems uh, beyond quantum theory itself, because we don't have to assume the um, you know, apparatus of unitary transformations and um, decoherence and, and so on that you usually do, uh, assuming these type of uh, theorems within quantum info. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, the, thank you. Um, are there any more questions from the audience? Uh, yeah, I'd like to ask a question if that's all right. Uh, sure, 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 go ahead, Jess. Uh, so my, so I, I'm really interested in these uh, experiments. I think the, uh, uh, proposal by Dan Carney uh, and collaborators, uh, I don't know, a few weeks ago. Uh, uh, very interesting. My major concern is that, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about like ruling out this large class of uh, alleged class of theories of gravity that is, is not kind of traditionally quantum. Maybe it's classical, maybe it's some sort of non-classical, but still non-quantum. Um, but I haven't seen any that are not horrible looking. Uh, so the, uh, the only uh, really concrete one that comes to mind is like a classical theory of gravity, where you, you, you know, it's, you know, gravity is sourced uh, by the expectation value of, uh, mm -hmm. and, and you have to end up in order to not just be in gross conflict with everything we see, you end up having to add like a collapse mechanism. Uh, or is that, that's, that's the only kind of way around it that I've seen. Yeah. Um, and this is, of course, you know, and it's maybe maybe it's just like a, a failure of us to 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 be able to imagine good theories. 
uh, but is, is, is there anything else that you think about when you think about like what, what actually could be going on? What could be the concrete alternative uh, to a fully quantum theory of gravity? Well, as I said, I think I, maybe I'm not the, the right person to be asked this question to because I have this, uh, so I, I think there's no problem. So I kind of very much with the idea that, that quantum theory makes more sense than uh, classical physics. So I'm kind of quite happy to go along with the idea that the gravity will be quantum. Uh, and, you know, we got some proposals, uh, we can probably improve on them, but uh, so I, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm not, I'm not a skeptic. Um, however, there are a number of uh, models. I think this has been around for a while. In a way, there's a beautiful paper by Don Page, who uh, imagined a quantum Cavendish experiment. Um, so in a way, what we are doing is maybe a generalization of, of, of that work, where he then already said that if you wanted to describe the full um, you know, way in which a quantum mass can behave, and then you want also to assume that there is some consistency of this description with the possibility of this mass uh, interacting with, with gravity in some way, um, then, then uh, the, the description of, of gravi the gravitational field or of gravity more generally can't be fully classical. So I think these ideas have been around for a while, but somehow they haven't um, refuted the, the, the proposals that other, the other camps are putting uh, forward. So we have, I mean, as you said, there are collapse theories, there's a uh, quantum field theory in curved space time, which is the thing that Don Page was uh, at the time trying to refute. Uh, so I think that's been known for a while that quantum field theory in curved space, curved space time is, is a limited uh, way of describing, um, you know, a quantum mass in, uh, in, in, a, um, in some background and you won't be able to describe the full uh, features of, of a quantum theory of, of gravity. But there are also other more subtle proposals that uh, have been put forward. Uh, so there are some hybrid quantum classical models. Uh, there's a vast uh, class of, of these models and um, they are not- Are there any in particular that you like? I, I'm just, I, all the ones no, I've seen- okay. Not really, because I, I think um, the interesting thing is that all of them have to either uh, give up on good features such as locality, um, or uh, they have to enter some interesting uh, way of, of interpreting, you know, so you, you have to put some um, uh, super selection rules. I'm thinking of Sudarshan's model to describe uh, classical apparatus interacting with the quantum system. Uh, so, so these models are not, uh, at least as far as I'm concerned, I don't think they're satisfactory, but we wanted a, a way of ruling them out conclusively. And so in a way, you know, if you're already in the, in the camp that says gravity is quantum, then you might be not interested in the experiment. But on the other hand, um, it's, I think it's important to just uh, have a conclusive evidence of source where we can abandon one specific way of looking at gravity and just try harder maybe to, uh, to find a, a good model of, of quantum gravity, for example. Um, or improve on the existing ones or, or trying to understand them better and, and so on. So I think that's the kind of spirit with which I'm proposing this, this, this work. Um, and the experiment is challenging, but I think uh, it, the other thing is that it shows that there is a way of, um, of accessing these non-classical features of gravity, even if you're not going to the regime where, um, you know, you're superposing Planck's mass, which is also a nice fact that comes out of this study. Uh, and it was somewhat surprising to the people in the quantum gravity community because we came from, from a different angle and somehow, you know, as quantum, you know, simple-minded quantum information theorists, we, uh, we just tried, you know, what is it that's closest to, to the logic that we usually uh, adopt when we think of, of quantum information protocols and it seemed to be fruitful in this context. Um, Anyway, so just to go back to your question, I think these classical models where they, dis, you know, these classical quantum hybrid models, some of them are physically implausible, but others are less uh, easy to rule out. So you could say I've got um, an intuition that they must be wrong, uh, but I think in a way it's nicer to have, um, you know, a, a, an experimental evidence that just says that they are not viable. Um, that's, that's why I think these experiments are important. 
Gotcha. Th thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, okay, so uh, there is one question from Stockholm and I was asked to read it from Jan Tuziemski from group of uh, Frank Wilczek. Uh, so uh, Hamiltonian formulation of general relativity is a, uh, a constrained Hamiltonian system. Uh, is this local according to your definition? I guess this is what Jan means. Yes, I think it's local. It um, local. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, okay. yeah, I think I think so long as this, uh, you know, no action to distance principle holds, um, then then the theory is local. So I would say it's local according to this definition that I have. Okay, okay, thank you. Uh, if I may now maybe now I have uh, I have a couple of questions. So uh, I must say I have my doubts. Like, what are we trying to prove? As far as I understand on the technical level, how you get the uh, phases, the phase differences in the experiment mm -hmm. with the two masses, it's very simple. It's like two qubits. It's two masses at two different positions, basically, yes. right? In, and they interact gravitationally. Now, in the pedestrian view, which I, that's the highest view I've reached, the pedestrian view is that they simply interact via a, a Coulomb interaction, which is uh, one over distance with, uh, between, between the masses. And since there are two masses with two possible distances, this of course creates uh, four mm -hmm. possibilities. And obviously this type, if you add this type of uh, interaction to, to a uh, two particle Schrodinger equation, entanglement is what you get generically. Okay, so at this level, it seems that, uh, I don't get me wrong, but I, it looks to me that you are basically probing a Coulomb interaction in a, a Schrodinger equation. Can I answer now or you have another sure, question? Sure, sure, sure. Okay. No, 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 no. Um, so the, this is a, a subtle point that I think has been raised a number of times. Uh, so two ways of looking at this. One is that one of the assumptions in this theorem um, is that the interaction has to be local and has to be um, such that the two masses are not interacting directly. And I think the Coulomb or Newtonian uh, potential type of interaction that you're describing violates this assumption because uh, you're not treating gravity as a third system that mediates uh, the exchange of, of, um, of you know, uh, interaction between a system one and system two, uh, but it's kind of making the two systems uh, talk directly. On top of it, I have to say that even in terms of the, you know, good old Coulomb interactions between two charges, I think there is a misconception about the way in which, um, in, in which it would be generating entanglement because the static Coulomb interaction is one that pertains to a, a static eternal distribution of charges that are just, you know, you've got two charges and they are there, they've been there forever and they're just sitting there and they're doing nothing. As soon as you move one of the charges dynamically, so, you know, you, you uh, for example, you try to uh, create a superposition, which is what we do in our experiment, you don't really appeal to uh, Coulombian inter Coulomb interaction or Newton uh, interaction because what you do is you have to have dynamically perturb this, this type of potential. And um, the dynamical perturbation that you induce on, on, the, on the initial state um, has some dynamical equations that even in classical <clears throat> electromagnetism you can Ooh. describe and they will propagate locally and class, you know, there is a kind of no signal in description of what's going on and so on. And those dynamical degrees of freedom, if you like, when you uh, quantize them, you can then treat as your mediator. And so what I haven't showed, showed uh, here, but I think it's in our papers and also in Sugato's papers, the right, if you want to have a dynamical model that is satisfactory to describe the phases, uh, what you have to do is to um, do a, a linear quantum gravity type of study, a linear expansion of the metric, and then uh, quantize the, the perturbation. And then you will see that the uh, gravitational field, which could also be the 
electromagnetic field, because these two uh, treatments are, are very similar to each other, um, is just, a, if you like, a collection of harmonic oscillators, and they uh, couple locally with the uh, two uh, charges or masses, and they are the mediators of the, of the interaction. And indeed, the Hamiltonian they write down, if you want to write it as a Hamiltonian, will contain two degrees of freedom of the field. One is number-like, it's the free energy of the field, if you like, and the other one is the um, uh, is, is, is a bit like the uh, momentum. So you've got A plus A dagger type term, which uh, is the one that, um, you know, in the language of quantum optics, kicks the field uh, with the coupling with the two uh, sources. And those two degrees of freedom and the number and the uh, A plus A dagger are the two non-commuting degrees of freedom that you need to create entanglement. If you don't have, uh, if you only have one of the two, you won't be able to do that. Uh, so are I think- pardon, is, that, is that so? Because, uh, you know, there yes. are these people like uh, Baylock who, for example, who say that uh, basically it's, it is enough to have a Coulomb term and the Coulomb term, it's nothing more than the uh, constraint uh, reduction. It's just following- So as I the said, the, the interaction between the two charges in that case is direct. And so it's not, the the so th there is a mm. there is an, a violation of this assumption of locality if you like uh, so so in that sense the the model and also the model is inadequate because as as I said earlier the Newtonian potential is not dynamical so in that uh, comment that they wrote um, and I think they kind of acknowledged that later because they uh, slightly corrected the view later. Um, they refer to, I think they misunderstood the, the, the point we made because they thought we were referring to a static Newtonian potential, but what we are, okay. what we are using there, it's an adiabatic approximation to describe what's going on, which is the standard one that you use even in describing Cow's experiment, uh, but it's not, so if you wanted to describe it accurately, you should think of, uh, you know, the, the charge distribution is slowly varying. Hence, I can think of um, a, a freezing it at each of the uh, you know, time evolution steps of the changes in the mass distribution or charge distribution. And I can compute the phase for that particular configuration. Then I can compute the phase for the next one, for the next one, for the next one, and then integrate along the path. That's the kind of thing I'm, we, we are thinking. But as the charge changes and it has to, the charge distribution has to modify has to change dynamically because otherwise you wouldn't be able to, to create the superposition and, and uh, confirm entanglements and so on. Uh, the Newtonian potential, strictly speaking, isn't sufficient because uh, that is a static uh, potential. So you need a, a, a dynamically evolving version of it. I would okay. like to add to this discussion the problem sure. of uh, the seeming non-locality of Coulomb has been settled by Feynman long time ago. There's a very nice paper where he shows that the combination of Coulomb, which is instantaneous interaction yes. with exchange of photons, yeah. which also have some ingredient of being not local because uh, of the nature of photon wave functions, this combined together owing to the continuity equation, which is very important here, gives a perfectly relativistic and local yeah. quantum electrodynamics. And this argument is one of the papers by Feynman. Yes. Yes, and I think there is a nice section in, in Cohen Tanuji where there is a problem where this is kind of, you know, the, the problem is about finding out uh, why, for example, if you describe the thing in the Coulomb gauge, uh, why is it that these, um, uh, there are some, some parts of the potential that seem, as, as, as you said, uh, to to kind of propagate in in a in a, in a way that violates uh, uh, you know uh, no signaling type of of, of uh, requirement, but then when you take into account all the terms, uh, then then this doesn't cause a problem at the level of fields because um, because there are other terms that cancel the non non local parts and and everything is fine, and and I think it's yeah so so I'm, I'm yeah I think it's true what you say uh, and. Um, it's a good point. But I think none of that is in the simple-minded Coulomb potential type of reasoning. And, and, and 
you can't see that that's the case unless you have a dynamical perturbation on top of the initial static distribution of charges. So you've got to think of, I've got two charges, I kind of wave one of them and, and what happens to the field of, uh, you know, at, at this other point. And that is a dynamical problem. Um, and uh, the point is that if you try to describe uh, the um, dynamical part of the, of the, of the potential, if you like, as a, as a, um, as a mediator of the interaction between these two entities, then um, if you assume that these two entities can be entangled, then this mediator has also got to be uh, non-classical. That, that's the kind of reasoning we are following. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, okay. Okay, so okay, I, I think I understand it now a, a little bit better. Mm, so this uh, Coulomb, uh, the message which I got uh, from you is that this Coulomb uh, potential, with, which indeed comes as a, only as a uh, mm, constraint uh, reduction procedure in, in general relativity, it's not enough. Yeah, yeah it's not uh, it's not enough, and and you have to rely on the. Uh, on the uh, dynamical, so uh, so to say, wave uh, degrees yes. of freedom of the of the gravitational field. Now, if I may ask uh, one more question. So, uh, as far as I understand, in your formalism, non-classical does not uh, necessarily mean quantum. So, in the sense that quantum, like uh, like uh, like we know it with the Hilbert spaces, density matrices, Born rule, Gleason theorem. And so on and so forth. So um, uh, uh, it's hard to imagine that this experiment will fail. So most probably, if uh, mm -hmm. if it is uh, if it is performed, uh, just like uh, made the analogy to Bell experiment, most probably we will expect that there will be a creation of entanglement. So based on that, uh, what what can you say based on your uh, knowledge, your your theorems? What can you say about gravitational field then? So what kind of non-classical field it is then? I like this question very much. I think it's, um, so the theorem is very, um, it's very agnostic about which, you know, what are these degree, degrees of freedom that uh, mediate the entanglement? What should they look like? And um, it's even agnostic about how to uh, formally uh, describe them. And the, um, so due to the fact that I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not a, a quantum gravity uh, person, uh, the only way I can think of the interaction really is in terms of this linear as model of quantum gravity, because it's, it's the one that uh, it's good to perform calculations uh, for this particular case. I think and, Bose does it, right? I think Bose, uh, Bose and collaborators in their paper, they introduce this uh, yes, linearized yes. gravity I, I somewhere we, we at the end the two, of paper. Uh, oh, you have the two, okay. Uh, yes, yes, I think, I think we have it in the supplementary um, okay. material. But there is another paper that we wrote, a PRD, where uh, we go a bit more into the details of what the Hamiltonian should look like, what are the degrees of freedom non commute, uh, and so on. Um, however, I don't think the experiment, so the experiment is much weaker than, than, than some people uh, have suggested. It wouldn't show that the, you know, linear quantum gravity has to be, so the gravitons exist or, or, or things of this sort. I, I, I don't think that's the case. I think uh, one of Sugato's collaborators is very strongly, um, uh, I think, uh, kind of uh, advocating the idea that this would somehow corroborate the model with gravitons and so on. Um, I prefer to have a, a, this more general view that the experiment simply rules out classical models of gravity that obey the axioms I outlined. Um, it's completely agnostic about what, what the mediator should be. And in a way, this is for uh, a good theory of quantum gravity to tell us. And you know, we just need a better um, you know, explanation for what's going on because you know, despite the fact that we can make calculations at that level with linear quantum gravity, and despite the fact that most quantum gravity proposals uh, tend to agree on that regime in the sense that they reduce one way or another to that model, uh, I think it would be much better to have, um, you know, a more fundamental understanding of what, um, you know, the, the two non-commuting features of space and geometry or, or, um, or of gravity, if you like, uh, are. And at the moment, I don't have an answer. I, I don't know. I, I think I, from the discussions I've had with with some people working loop quantum gravity and 
um, other non perturbative approaches, um, they find it hard to model this, this type of simple interaction other than by, you know, taking the limit to linear quantum gravity and then computing the way we did. So in that sense, um, you know, it would be nice if someone could, could just try to, to, to link these two non-commuting degrees of freedom that can mediate entanglement with the more fundamental quantum entities that appear in non-perturbative approaches to quantum gravity. But at the moment, I don't think we have that. We, 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 we don't mm -hmm. know. Uh, okay, uh, before a uh, question from Pavel, if I, if I might, th there is one more uh, competitor on the, on the market, uh, Jonathan mm -hmm. Oppenheim, and, uh, and his, uh, his model of a, a classical quantum hybrid. Are you, mm -hmm. are you aware of that? So does it somehow uh, look promising? Um, so I am not completely sure of, about what um, his uh, proposal uh, would predict in this case. I don't mm. think his papers have, uh, you know, a generation of entanglement type of scenario. I have to say this is a general features of, of hybrid models. So for example, there is this Sudarshan model, which is very nice. And um, it's one where by, so he's imagining two uh, systems that can be both described by quantum theory. It's just that one of them is the classical apparatus and by classical he means that all of the um, non-commuting so there is a classical variable a classical observable which is the one that can be measured and used to measure other systems uh, but then there are other degrees of freedom that are not uh, observable such as conjugate momentum to that uh, particular variable in question um, uh, and this um, conjugate momentum is somehow protected from measurement through a super selection rule. And in that way, he can measure, he can model some kind of interaction with another system that uh, corresponds to a measurement uh, of, of a feature of another quantum system in a consistent way, because overall the evolution is unitary and it's using these other non-commuting degrees of freedom of the alleged uh, classical system. But by the assumption that you can never measure anything else nothing, you know, you can never measure uh, anything else other than this classical variable on the classical system, then the assumption, I mean, the, the, the statement is that the system is effectively classical. Uh -huh. Now, in that case, uh -huh. if you try to generalize that to uh, creating entanglement between two quantum systems, you will see that this super selection rule is inconsistent because when you generate entanglement between two quantum systems through a mediator, uh, this is something I worked out with Emanuele, with my student. Um, the, well, you can just see that if you're applying simply the rules of quantum theory, uh, the degrees of freedom of the two quantum systems that you then use in order to confirm entanglement, um, which are basically two non-commuting variables of each of these two systems, um, are a function, if you describe all of this in the Eisenberg picture, they are a function of both x and pi of the mediator. So they are mm -hmm. a function of both degrees of freedom that don't commute. So in the case of Sudarshan, I think the fact that he was only confining attention to a specific interaction was OK. Uh, but as soon as you require the interaction to be able to create entanglement, you are violating the super selection rule. So that's one way in which the proposal that we are talking about could fail. But as I said, I'm not, I'm not particularly familiar with Oppenheim's uh, proposal. The only thing, other thing I know is that I think he uh, recently had um, a discussion during a, a sem one of the seminars of this um, um, a series, the KISS, uh, QISS series of seminars. And during that discussion, he seemed to have implied that he cannot generate entanglement with this model, uh, which wouldn't okay. surprise me. The other thing that can happen is that his model is non-local, in which case, if it's non-local, then it's a bit like Bohmian mechanics, which we all know can generate the statistics of quantum theory, but um, the ontology, the descriptors of the subsystems are behaving this weird way that they are non local. So, uh, in that sense, it would be ruled out by, you know, by the assumption of, uh, of the theorem. Anyway, I, it, maybe it's a nice thing to look into. I think I've been mm. um, meaning to do that. Uh, but I, my, my impression is that the theorem is. So what, what happens usually is that if you have a model that violates this theorem, it just means that either it doesn't satisfy the assumptions or, um, uh, well, or, 
it doesn't generate entanglement because there's also the possibility that sometimes there, there was another proposal I think by Hall and Reginato that we recently uh, wrote a kind of response to. And it's very interesting that the um, dynamical uh, description in phase space of say two harmonic oscillators, purely classical, can lead you to, to states that appear correlated in ways that are more or less isomorphic to the way they would look in the quantum case. Except that because the systems are classical, you can't claim that they are entangled because they wouldn't, you know, you, you wouldn't be violating bell inequalities with those states. They're just correlated, but they're not correlated in the relevant way. Uh, and so um, that's a third possibility that can happen where it's possible to generate weak to weak false entanglement, so to say, right? False yes, so entanglement. It's, yes, it's mm -hmm. possible to create weaker correlations, um, but but not the correlations that you need to to you know. Let's say, operationally speaking, we want to violate Bell inequalities. That's like maybe a, a, a sufficient thing that we would like to, to achieve. In that case, that's not the kind of correlations that we're interested in. It, you know, it, um, and it's in a way the theorem doesn't apply. You know, if you can create other types of correlations, it's an open question whether you can maybe weaken the requirement of generating entanglement, generating mm -hmm. something less than entanglement, uh, that I don't know. But maybe it's kind of an interesting question to look into. Okay, okay, thank you very much. Uh, Chiara, there is a question from uh, Gdańsk, from Paweł Chorodecki. Paweł, Hello. the microphone is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you for, for, for the talk. Uh, just a very simple question. First, uh, touching this correlations issue. I guess it's immediate from, from your theorem that, uh, that if the mediator creates um, a weaker correlation, but still quantum in quotation marks, you know, like those discord type or something, Somehow it should be immediate that it doesn't, I mean, it doesn't follow uh, the, the central theorem. Could, is it possible to pinpoint, you know, this, this why is it so? Um, I guess because the, um, so th th that's a nice kind of question. Um, so I guess the, the point is that when, um, uh, so, I mean, if you wanted a response within uh, quantum theory, you could say that, uh, we know that the classical mediator can somehow create some discord-like uh, type of correlation because we can just, you know, prepare a state over here, zero, one, and then tell someone else to prepare either zero or plus, let's say. Um, and, mm -hmm. and that telling someone else is a completely classical operation that um, can, be, can be described in, in um, you know, in, in a way that doesn't involve these non-commuting observables. Um, I don't know if you were to impose further constraints on the way the dynamics should work, whether you could perhaps uh, also show that you can't generate discord, because this general setting that I told you now is a very, you know, uh, information like, information theory like thing. Uh, but we don't know if uh, with gravity, we, we are really restricted to, to a much smaller set of operations. And in a way, I guess there must be a trade off maybe uh, you know, if you can restrict the type of operations you can, uh, you're allowed to perform on the channel, then perhaps you can still say that even if you have weaker correlations, you can also prove that the, that you need a, a non-commuting type of uh, mean. Exactly, exactly. So, so there should be then some trade-off between the uh, kind of superposition of local system and the yes. capacity of information your interaction could carry. Okay, and then obviously you could. Probably you could have it. Uh, so uh, coming back to the central central issue, uh, you were speaking about gravity mostly. I understand that this generally would apply to any hypothetical, you know, uh, interaction that somehow comes from outside of quantum mechanics, but in some sense just respects superposition, whatever it means. In a sense that it doesn't decohere that superposition while carrying. The, uh, the say message, the interaction, right? So in that sense, it's a very universal picture. Yes, yes. And, and, and the last thing, you know, um, in it, I understand, as far as I understand, your theorem is uh, very general. So it, in a, some sense, it doesn't involve space time. It has an abstract concept of locality. It's that, that, that type of locality that is used in general probability, GPTs, okay, theories, right? So, so my question is like this, if you try to put this on, uh, on, on the top of space-time, uh, then it's known that uh, 
you know, locality is not the same as relativistic causality. I mean, no causal loops doesn't mean locality in that sense, you know? So my question is, what could have changed in that new picture? Uh, in the new, sorry. The, the, the picture when you have, when you have put it on the space time, okay? And say not uh, drop locality and just put uh, 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 causality in, in, you know, in a space time uh, manner. Yes, Th this is a great question. I, I think it's, um, uh, so I mean, the short answer is I don't know um, because it's, uh, so all, the whole theorem is rooted in this, um, if you like, uh, neighborhood like idea of, of, you know, in each neighborhood of, of so you, you, you kind of, you can think of, of um, um, the same type of approximations that you make in, in uh, say quantum information where you're thinking that um, you can uh, maybe foliate some kind of uh, space time into, into uh, Cauchy surfaces and then find the direction of time. And then you can then talk about locality on that 3D, um, uh, you know, uh, manifold, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, but I think the, so this question is completely open and I, I, I think I can only um, sort of speculate about the fact that um, the, so there are two ways in which this can go. One way is that there is a generalization of this assumption of locality. Um, and then there is a meaningful way of setting up a protocol to generate entanglement is this more general uh, setting. Um, uh, or uh, it could be that this work only holds for space times where you can perform this kind of foliation. Um, and um, this in a sense, is uh, restrictive because there are, you know, hypothetical space times where we can't do that. Yeah. But at the same time, it's, um, you know, it's still general enough, I hope, because it covers these uh, cases where, where, you know, are the space times where we know we can set up an experiment and test theories in the way that we expect uh, to be able to do so. Um, uh, I mean, I wouldn't know, for example, how to how to generalize this to space time that has uh, geometry like. Uh, I don't know some some Gödel's universe or or something like that where where these type of structure doesn't apply, but I think it's a it's a very nice question, um, and in a way I'm kind of learning slowly about GR and there's things to see whether I can maybe you know with with my collaborators address this uh, at some point. But it's it's a nice question. About the other point that you made, I think it's um, um, it's an interesting question. It's an interesting feature of this quantum channel if you think about it in the I like to think about it in the Eisenberg picture because um, I think Gottesman liked uh, quantum information in the Eisenberg picture. So he, he had these various uh, ways of describing error correcting codes with, uh, with evolving spin uh, operators. And the, um, in that sense, the channel capacities in terms of the, you know, the non-commuting power of, of, of the channel. And exactly. that's the thing that, as you said, has to be preserved. So maybe another way of looking about what at what you said is that instead of about superpositions, you can talk about these uh, Q numbers that that yes, you know, yes, yes, pertain yes, to the yes, channel, yes. and they are the thing, the vectors. And you should perturbed, perturbed commutation relation by a very small. Yeah. <laughs> thing. Yes, yes. yes. Exactly. 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 Yeah. Thank Thanks you for the much. questions. Yeah. Very thank great. you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we've had a very nice, intense discussion. Um, are there any more questions? Okay, doesn't seem like that. Uh, all right, so Chiara, thank you very much for uh, for your time. Thank you very much for a very interesting and inspiring talk, for answering all our questions. Uh, it has been a pleasure to have you here. Likewise. Thank you. Thank you again, and thank you for all who attended and uh, participated. We had a quite international, intercontinental, actually, uh, seminar today. Yeah. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much for the questions and uh, for listening to my talk and for inviting me. It was great. Our, our pleasure. <laughs>